Take a couple of good long deep in and out breaths. Notice where you feel the breathing process in the body most clearly. Focus your attention there, and then ask yourself if long breathing is comfortable. If it is, you keep it up. If not, you can change. You can make it even longer or shorter, deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter, faster, slower. Try to notice what rhythm and texture of breathing feels good for the body right now. When you find a rhythm that feels good, stick with it. And then think of that comfortable breath energy spreading through the body. You can either think of it radiating out like light from the the spot where you're focused, or you can think of different breath channels in the body, down the spine, out the legs, down the back of the neck, down the shoulders and the arms, down the front of the body, coming into the head from all directions. Play with the breath for a while. Because the whole point of this is they're trying to get the mind to settle down. And if you force it down, it may resist. But if you give it something to play with, something to explore, it gets absorbed without even thinking about concentration. After all, this is the breath energy in your body. This is what keeps you alive, keeps the body and the mind together. keeps the blood flowing well, keeps the nerves healthy. So it only stands to reason that it should be interesting. At the same time, you're fulfilling several of the steps in breath meditation, being aware of the whole body, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in a way that gives rise to a sense of rapture or refreshment, breathing in a way that gives rise to a sense of pleasure. Breathing in a way that gladdens the mind or concentrates the mind. You're engaged in mindfulness practice and concentration at the same time. Because the Buddha's instructions for how you get the mind into right concentration are there in right mindfulness. You stay focused on the body in and of itself, in this case it's the breath. Ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. In other words, you've got one topic that you're focused on. As for anything else that comes up that's related to the world, you put it aside. That's the formula for establishing mindfulness, but it's also a description of the mind as it's settling down in a concentration. The alertness and the ardency turn into evaluation as you're evaluating the breath. The mindfulness there relates to directed thought, and those two qualities, directed thought and evaluation, together with singleness of preoccupation, where you're staying with one thing, those are the causal factors that get you into right concentration. When you do things right, then the other factors come, a sense of refreshment, a sense of pleasure. The refreshment in some cases can be really strong, one of the reasons why it's also translated as rapture. In other cases, it's more gentle, a sense of fullness, that you feel just right being right here. The energy feels full in the body. Then you simply maintain that. The mind can go through various stages as you let go of the directed thought and evaluation or simply there with the, the breath, you become one with the sensation of the breath. And a sense of rapture becomes too intense, so you drop that. Go for a sense of pleasure, and finally even the sense of pleasure becomes gross, 
you settle down with a sense of equanimity. That's the standard def definition or description of the four levels of jhana. But when the Buddha talks about noble right concentration, he has another factor. He calls it having your theme well in hand. He illustrates it with a, an analogy. He says either a person sitting watching someone lying down or a person standing watching someone sitting. You're basically stepping back and observing your mind in concentration. When you're fully planted in the object, you can't do that. But you can pull back a little bit and yet not destroy the concentration. And you can see where things are going well, where they're not going well. It's an extension of evaluation, but it can be applied to any other levels, because this fits in with the Buddha's observation that the Dharma is learned through commitment and reflection. With commitment, we're sticking with one object. And then with reflection, we're trying to do it well, trying to notice when what we're doing is working, what's not working, making adjustments. It's in this way that the concentration improves, and also your discernment develops. Because discernment is all about seeing things in terms of cause and effect. Sometimes you're defined as seeing the nature of things as they are. But the Buddha was less interested in things as they are than as, as how they work. After all, I, you could say that all things change, and sometimes you hear that as the definition of Buddhist wisdom or the beginning of wisdom, all things change. But it's not a very useful observation on its own, because it doesn't say why they change, how they change, what kind of change is good, what kind of change is bad. But if you put that observation in the context of the Four Noble Truths and their duties, then you can refine it and actually make it useful. Because the first truth is the truth of stress or suffering. And the duty there is to comprehend it. To comprehend it means to understand it to the point of getting past any passion, aversion, or delusion around it. Stress is defined as the five clinging aggregates. Where are you going to see those aggregates? You see them in the concentration. The breath is part of form. The feeling of pleasure that arises as you stay focused, that's a feeling. The perception, the mental image you have of the breath, that's perception. You direct a thought and evaluation as you try to adjust the breath, play with the breath. make the most of the sense of pleasure that comes from being with the breath. That's fabrication. And then there's consciousness of these things. And so you want to see how these things change. As the mind gets more settled in, that kind of change is a good thing. But then you notice, as the mind gets concentrated, even in concentration there are ups and downs in the level of stress, ups and downs in the level of focus. You try to iron those out, and to some extent you can, but there are certain things that, even in the most stable level of concentration, are a little bit uneven. After all, it is a fabricated thing. We're trying to put the path together. So we tweak that sentence that all things are subject to change. All fabrications are subject to change. And remember, where do fabrications come from? They come from intentions. Intentions come from where? They come from the mind. So you're not interested in things in general outside, whether they change or not. You're interested in the products of the mind. And they change because the mind changes. And it's precisely here that you want to see cause and effect, because after all, that's what the Four Noble Truths are about. The second truth, craving, is the cause for suffering. The fourth Noble Truth, the path, is not the cause for the cessation of suffering, but it takes you there. It 
when the Buddha laid out dependent co-arising, it's all about causes and effects. This is the kind of insight we want. And how do we gain this insight? Not simply by sitting there and watching something passively. You have to be proactive. This is why we make a state of concentration, and then we adjust it, then we refine it, try to extend it as long as we can. Because the best things to know, or the easiest things to know in terms of cause and effect, are the things that you do. So you're doing something with the mind. It's like learning about eggs. You can sit there and look at an egg for a long time and see that, yes, eventually over time it does rot. But that's not very useful knowledge. More useful is you take the egg, break it, make different things out of it. Make scrambled eggs, make steamed eggs, make omelets, souffles. You learn a lot about the eggs that way. You, know, you also learn about yourself. In terms of your own ingenuity, your own precision in developing a skill, your powers of observation. You see what your input into the into the world, your input in this case, your input into the eggs, does to those eggs. And here's where the analogy breaks down. Because what you're trying to do is see that the things that the mind does have their drawbacks. And you'd rather find something that is free of those drawbacks, free from the fabrication. But again, you get sensitive to fabrication by trying to do it as skillfully as you can. And when you reflect properly, you begin to see, I've done this, I did that, I, this is unnecessary, this is causing stress, I can drop that. You pair things away. And you finally get down to something that is not fabricated. The Buddha calls it the deathless. He calls it lots of different things. I think there's some 30-some names for nirvana. But it doesn't matter what you call it. The fact is, it's there. And it's worth all the work that goes into the practice. So it's through this pattern of commitment and reflection that we learn about cause and effect. And we gain a knowledge that is really useful in putting an end to the causes for suffering. And it all starts right here with the breath. It's pretty amazing. If it weren't for the Buddha, we probably wouldn't have thought of looking at the breath. But of course, it's not just the breath. It's as you bring the mind to the breath, bring all of your mind to the breath, and you see how they interact. That's when where you learn all you need to know about what suffering is, why it is, and how you can bring it to an end.